long story short, my first three years in this journey, we went from 40 deals to 165 to 300 plus by year three. And we were making millions of dollars, but I was miserable with the people that we, uh, I shouldn't say all of them. We had a couple people in seats that really shouldn't have been in the seat. And then also it's really falls on us that we didn't set the right expectations. We didn't have the right trainings. We should have had better onboarding. And so things just kind of came crashing down. If you're a real estate investor and are wondering how to raise and leverage private money to make more profit on every deal, then you're in the right place. On Raising Private Money, we'll speak with new and seasoned investors to dissect their deals and extract the best tips and strategies to help you get the money, because the money comes first. Now here's your host, Jay Connor. Welcome to another episode of Raising Private Money. I'm your host, also known as the Private Money Authority, Jay Connor from Moorhead City, North Carolina. And here on the show, what in the world do we talk about? You got it. Raising Private Money. I'm so excited to have as my guest today, an individual that is very, very special. As a matter of fact, she and her husband have already raised over $20 million dollars and private money. And we're going to get her to pull back the curtain and talk about here in just a moment exactly how she does it. She and her husband have been full-time in the real estate industry since 2015. And they actually began their real estate investing career by buying rentals and flipping houses. So actually in their first year in real estate, they did a pretty phenomenal job by uh, flipping, oh, a little bit more than 40 houses. But in their second year in business, they really, really expanded their business. They wholesaled 165 houses. And then in their third year of the business, um, they did wholesaling, they did flips. As a matter of fact, they did over 300 rehabs and flips and wholesales. And since that time, they've done over 300 transactions of wholesaling flips every year since that time. Well, along the way, they have created some very, very unique systems that automates their business. And these systems also put together and recruit people to be on their teams, uh, how to get people onboarded, how to get people trained, uh, how to actually build a machine that's built off the foundation of recruiting phenomenal people to be on your team. In addition to that, they've actually built a team that has created a phenomenal uh, sales floor, and we're going to be talking about that as well. This year, they are on track to do over $4 million in revenue, and check this out, and that's just not revenue. That's with over a 50% net margin on their flipping and wholesaling business. So I'm so excited to bring here on the show with me a very special guest. You're going to meet Josh, excuse me, you're going to meet Josh's wife, Tiffany High, right after this. Well, hey there, Tiffany. Welcome to Raising Private Money. Thanks for having me. I'm excited. I'm excited to have you here. Well, since the name of the show is Raising Private Money, let's just dive into talking about how in the world you and Josh have raised $20 million in private money for your real estate investing business. So let's start. Tell us the story of how you got started in raising private money and how you got your private, your first private money lender. Yeah. Um, so my first year in real estate, we actually started as a rehabber, not a wholesaler or anything. And I went to a boot camp to learn how to raise money. Um, and so essentially at that boot camp, they had encouraged everyone to practice or role play with their friends and peers before going and pitching it to somebody that you're trying to be serious with. And so um, I created my own little custom pitch. And now every single time that I meet somebody new in my life, I do this soft pitch and it works every time. Um, and I've been doing it for, uh, you know, six years at this point. So if you want, I can do the pitch with you live. 
My Lance, I would love for you to do the the pitch with me live. Go for it. All right. So let's just say I'm at a family barbecue or a friend's barbecue and they have their aunt and uncles there and somebody walks up to me and says, what do you do for a living? I always say, thanks for asking. Um, I raise money from people just like me and you. They act as the bank on the properties that I buy at 30 to 50% discounts to the current market. I renovate the pro the house in less than four weeks. I turn it in less than 90 days, typically. I pay my private lenders 1% a month. They act as the bank. They have a recorded mortgage. And I do that hundreds of times a year. And I average $23,000 of profit per deal. And then I go silent. And you can always tell when somebody has some extra money laying around because you can tell their head starts spinning. And they go, wow, tell me more about that is typically what I get next. And so instead of coming out and trying to hard pitch somebody, I always take an educational approach. And I just said, hey, yeah, I mean, if you want, I can just send email you a credibility packet that I have. It just spells out what private money is 101. It has frequently asked questions, explains the process. Um, and in addition, it probably will help you understand where maybe money's laying around that you don't even know. Maybe like you have equity in your home. Maybe you can get access to an unsecured credit line if you have good credit and you didn't even know. You know, maybe you can get the credit line at 3%, lend it out at 12 and make 9% while you sleep. How does that sound? And then they're like, yeah, yeah, email it to me. So I email it and then I just follow up in two weeks, jump on a call and start building the relationship of just educating them on what it is. And then eventually they always say, oh, I have 50 grand or I have 100 grand. What can you do with it? And that's really how we build up our private money um, to a point where we don't necessarily have to pitch it much anymore, which means that I need to get some bigger deals. But that's another problem and another, another for another day. <laughs> <laughs> My guess, Tiffany, is that you've got the same problem, quote unquote, that I do today and that I've had for years. And that is I got more private private money than I can use. How about you? Yep. Yep. So I got to get some bigger deals because single family isn't keeping it full. <laughs> there you go. Well, come here to my county in eastern North Carolina. My average profit is $78,000 right now in our little area. But let me don't mislead you. I don't have any competition. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you just said a lot, Tiffany, in a very, very short period of time. You just pulled the curtain back on some very, very important nuggets those aren't nuggets. Those are actually gold rocks uh, that you just shared. So let's go back and talk about what you just said. One of the first things I heard you, and so I, I, don't want, I don't want my listeners to miss this. One of the first things I heard you say is when you are at a social gathering or any kind of gathering for that matter, and you meet someone new and they ask you what you do, you talk about private money is what you do. That's yep. what you do. And we're so, go ahead. Yeah, so although I flip and wholesale houses and all that, I don't frame it in that way. I frame it as in I raise money to do this, which allows me to make the money. Yeah, it's like, you know, it's been my experience that if someone asks me what I do and I tell them I'm a real estate entrepreneur, I flip houses, um, you know, and have a conversation like that, number one, you can just see in their eyes, so what, right? It's like you tell somebody you're a real estate entrepreneur or you're a flipper. It's like, who cares? But isn't it pretty cool when you answer the question, what do you do with number one, talking about private money and private lending? It's been my experience, Tiffany, that just that conversation arouses curiosity because are most of your private lenders like mine in the fact that they never heard of private money or private lending or even self-directed IRAs until you told them about it, right? Yeah, I actually prefer it that way because the more sophisticated they are, the more money they're going to charge. So <laughs> um, if somebody doesn't understand what private money is, then they only know what I teach them. And, you know, obviously... Anyone watching this doesn't want to teach somebody with 500 grand laying around what points are like, that's just not a term that you even want to educate somebody on. Um, and then, you know, you really are the one that gets to say, Hey, I lend out at this percent to this percent. 
you know, give them a range of what's appropriate for you and what you're looking for and let them come back and say, oh, that doesn't interest me if it's not under this percent. Okay, great. What if I can do that? Um, and so ultimately it's like crack cocaine for these guys. As soon as they lend one deal and they make that interest while they're sleeping, they'll, it won't, it'll be never ending. And the beauty is once you give a great experience to one lender, they tell their family, their friends, their brothers, their sisters. Um, and so it's just about getting over the hump to getting them to do one deal, make the interest. And then, then you can be like, Hey, if you know anyone else, let me know. Um, and it always works out that way. So what you're saying is in this world of private money, with you having your teacher hat on and teaching people about private money, you make the rules as the borrower, not the lender, right? That's what I try to do. <laughs> well, as you said, you know, if I'm talking to someone that's already loaned private money out to real estate investors, then there's really not much teaching to do. As you said, I would much rather teach someone about private money and private lending, and they, they never heard about it. And, you know, quite frankly, when they hear about these high rates of return that they can get safely and securely, as you mentioned, we're not borrowing money unsecured. We're giving them a mortgage or a deed of trust to back that, that note that they have. As you said, I mean, it's like crack cocaine. When they get it, they just want to keep earning money. Let me ask you yep. a question, Tiffany. When you've got a when you got a flip and you are paying off that uh, deal and you've uh, cashed it out, what does your private lender tell you, or what do they ask you? Oh, they're like, when when are we rolling this into the next deal? <laughs> yeah, my, my sometimes my first, my private lender has loaned me money on a deal and they've never loaned before. It's their first deal. I'll say, hey, look, we're cashing this out. I'm gonna be sending your uh, sending a payoff to you on your principal. They'll like almost scream or beg over the phone. Can't you just keep the money? Can't you just keep the money, right? And keep earning an interest. And of course, I don't. I don't keep the money unless that money, that loan has got a uh, collateral, has got real estate that I can keep that, you know, back for them. You know, one thing that surprises people, Tiffany, when I talk about private money, I'll tell real estate investors, I'll say, listen, you know what? I've never asked anybody for money. I've never pitched a deal. And they say, Jay, how in the world have you got millions and millions and millions of dollars from private lenders and you've never asked for money? You've never pitched a deal. In my case, Tiffany, it's real simple. Number one, I've never pitched. a. I mean, I've never asked for money because, first of all, I teach people like you do what private money and private lending is and you know, I don't have to ask them for it. After I teach the program, they're chasing and begging me. I uh, want to know, well, what do I do? Write you a check? Why are you funds? Of course, the answer is no to that. We have all the funds from our private lenders uh, directly wired to our real estate attorney uh, escrow account for, you know, when we have a uh, when we have a deal to actually fund. I've never pitched a deal. Like they tell me how much they've got to work with. If it's in retirement funds, of course, I will introduce them to the self-directed IRA company that I recommend. They'll get that fund or they get their account funded there. We'll put their money to work as soon as possible. But when someone has told me they have X number of dollars to use and I've got a deal for them to fund, Tiffany, I simply call them up, have a little chit chat. And here's my script. I say, hey, I've got great news for you. I can now put your $150,000 to work. I've got a house in Newport with an after repair value of $200,000. The funding required is $150,000. I know they got $150,000. They already told me a couple of weeks ago. Closing is next Thursday, so I need for you to have your funds wired to my real estate attorney by next Wednesday. End of conversation. You know, Tiffany, I never ask them if they want to fund the deal. That's the most stupid question in the world. I could ever ask them. Of course, they want to fund the deal. They've been waiting for the phone call ever since I taught them about private money. So, Tiffany, let me ask you a question. When's the worst time in the world to be raising private money? I'm always raising money. I tell you, the worst time to be raising private money is when you need it for a deal. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You definitely need to be uh, ready for when the deal's actually there. <laughs> The best time to be raising private money, as you said, you're always attracting raising your friend, always attracting private money for when there's no particular deal involved. 
Um, you know, it's been my experience, unfortunately, when I started out. I'll tell you, Tiffany, for me to get something right, I got to screw it up really good to start with and for me to, like, figure it out and get it right. But, um, you know, I figured out a long time ago, if I teach my private lending program and I present a deal in the same conversation initially, I sound like I'm begging. I sound like I'm desperate. And I'm not even trying to sound like I'm desperate. I mean, do you agree? Yeah. You know, another thing that we've done is that over the course of time, um, I have a someone on my staff that really manages the relationship. I think it adds more credibility to also, you know, it's like being in a boyfriend girlfriend relationship. When you make you make someone feel like you're needy, they want to run away. But if you make someone feel like you don't need them, they want more and more. Um, and so I try to make sure that from a posture perspective, that lenders don't ever feel like I absolutely need them. So tell me more about how you have someone on your team managing the relationship. What do you mean by that? And what does that look like? Uh, my operations coordinator who manages all of our transactions and rehab uh, management. Uh, so we've built the relation. I'm the one that, you know, meets the person, builds the relationship. And then I set expectations that, hey, you know, Brittany on our team is the one that drafts the paperwork, manages the in and out of the loan, and ultimately will also reach out to you for properties that we have available just know that when we send them out, we typically get them funded immediately. So um, if you have questions, you're welcome to call me on the property. But ultimately, a lot of my lenders these days, like we just send a text and say we need 300 grand by Friday and we get it done. Um, so it's just all about relationship building. As long as you get one deal done with them and they see the process, they believe in it now, and they understand how the paperwork works and you build their confidence in you as in your operation, and especially as you repeat that a couple of times, they just want more and more and more. So if anything, they're coming after us all the time saying, when's my next deal? When's my next deal versus the other way around? Absolutely. I can relate exactly to what you're talking about. Tiffany, let's give away to our listeners a gift that shows them exactly what you and I are talking about. I'm excited about the new private money guide that I just recently finished writing. It's called in this private money, seven reasons why private money will explode your real estate investing business. And if you are listening and you want to get on this fast track to getting private money and never missing out on a deal because you didn't have the funding and putting you in the control seat, in the driver's seat, where you got more money to use for your real estate deals, then you know what to do with. You can download this money guide for free at www.jayconner, J A Y. C O N N E R dot com forward slash money guide. Again, that's J Connor with an E R, J A Y C O N N E R dot com forward slash money guide. Tiffany, let's move on to this amazing organization that you and your husband Josh have built. Um, you have put in these systems that include recruiting, onboarding, training. What does that look like? Um, you know, when I first started in real estate and, uh, I had joined a few masterminds. I mean, we've been in every mastermind, I feel like in every program out there and especially for the younger folks in the industry that maybe have never worked in corporate life or anywhere else for that matter. Um, a lot of people struggle to understand that people are what moves a company forward. So yes, it's systems and processes and all these, you know, tactical things that we have to do. But ultimately, putting the right people in the right seat, onboarding them the right way, and ongoing training um, is what's going to sustain the right talent. And ultimately, when we came into the industry, we did get a lot of really bad advice about how to put people in seats and set expectations, and they were all over the place. And unfortunately, I was listening to people who also didn't know how to lead people and probably never have in their life. Um, and I made a lot of bad decisions um, along the way that I just didn't understand. And so long story short, my first three years in this journey, we went from 40 deals to 165 to 300 plus by year three. And we were making millions of dollars, but I was miserable with the people that we, I shouldn't say all of them. We had a couple people in seats that really shouldn't have been in the seat. And then also it's really falls on us that we didn't set the right expectations. We didn't have the right trainings. We should have had better onboarding. 
And so things just kind of came crashing down. Um, and so we had invested into a family friend who had built five or six multi-million dollar companies off of building phone sales floors. And we had paid him to come in and physically sit in my office for almost three months. Um, and he instilled all of the corporate infrastructure that we have now from recruiting, onboarding, training, call audits, performance reviews, performance management, and all of these different frameworks to best lead people. And I think that especially in our industry, um, our industry tends to attract, you know, a lot of hustlers or people grinding in the wholesaling space and people come in without this leadership background. And ultimately you can't just like wake up one day, start a company and think that that makes you a leader. As leadership is a skill set that needs to be groomed. And it never is a never ending um, training that us leaders have to have because what my leadership skill set was three years ago with a team of 10 is completely different than what it takes to take that team to 50 or 100 people. And so ultimately what we decided to do was really build a strong framework for people on the recruiting, onboarding, and training because so many people enter, and it's not just our industry, but they think, well, if I do it all, I have control and they don't let go. And a lot of times they don't let go because they just don't know how. And so no one's really educating the recruiting, onboarding, and training process and really honed in because it's like going on your first date. If I give you a bad impression on your first date, no matter how much of a match we could have been, it won't work if I don't give you a good first impression on my company. So we really hone in onboarding um, for your first two to three weeks at the company so that you have a really positive start to being here. Um, and so that's really a niche that, you know, a lot of people look up to us on is just how much emphasis we put on that within the industry. Tiffany, how would you answer this question? <clears throat> Let's say you're visiting with a real estate investor, say a husband and wife uh, like yourself and Josh, and they've been in the business, you know, maybe a year or two. They want to grow, but, you know, they just sort of work their, you know, knuckles to the bone and they know they need a team. Um, they want to bring on a team, but they just really don't know where or how to start building a team. What's the first step in building a team and even knowing the type of talent and skill set that you're looking for to help grow your business? So if it's a husband and wife that are working together, the first thing I recommend to any partnership regardless is taking a business partnership evaluation survey. Um, funny story, Josh and I took that survey when we were engaged to get married. And unfortunately, at the time, we answered every single question, the complete opposite, which was not a good thing. Um, and it was just everything from our characteristics to financial, how to, where do we want to go? When do we want to retire? Where do we want to take the company? And a lot of times people jump into partnerships out of fear of failure because there's things that they're not strong at. So they think they should partner versus hire. Um, and then they also get in a partnership because maybe a friend wants to work with them or a family member. And so ultimately, I think the first step is identifying what are the roles and responsibilities as the partnership, and then going from there of what's the first thing that's going to drive revenue the fastest possible, because revenue always allows you to keep growing the company. So if we go back to when we originally started, me and Josh are both very, very good at sales and communication. So um, we focused our efforts on acquisitions and revenue. So I knew that I needed to hire an admin immediately when I started the company. Um, so my executive assistant has been with us since the day we started. Um, and then from there we hired an acquisitions person. And I think ultimately I can't give you a one size fits all answer on what somebody should hire. It's all about your individual skill set. But at the end of the day, no matter what, in your first two to three hires, it should be 100% on your acquisitions or sales side, no matter what type of company you have. Um, because as you continue to build the company, take on more systems and sophisticate things, we got to continue to bring in the revenue to continue to grow the company. And the more leverage you have on the sales floor, the more power it gives you to grow the company. So a lot of big rehabbers, I unfortunately see hire like a project manager and all these things first. And I'm not saying that that's the wrong um, or if that's the wrong answer, but ultimately they get caught sometimes by not having someone always focused on bringing revenue in 
So what happens is if they have a dry month or a dry week, they freak the hell out because they have all this overhead that doesn't drive revenue. Um, so I always encourage a lot of my students that are one or two man shows, hey, are you good at sales? Because if so, let's make that your primary focus and surround you first with somebody that frees your time to bring in more revenue. Um, but either way, you should immediately be hiring that team. Um, and so in my opinion, I think in your first one to two hires, it has to be all about revenue. One phenomenal um, <laughs> army, one phenomenal army you have built is an army of virtual assistants. You have uh, you put together like over 130 turnkey virtual assistants to assist real estate investors in their uh, business. What do these virtual assistants do uh, and the type of service that you can provide to other real estate investors? Um, so we work closely with a company or two different VA companies. One of them is more operationally driven. So when they have VAs that come in, they know they are fully trained for two months before they can get a client on everything in my back end. And one of the biggest things that we did a little bit differently in helping them build their company was you go to a lot of VA companies and they recruit a virtual assistant for you. And most people in our industry will be like, okay, this virtual assistant is going to be like HR and marketing and this and that and this and that. And then it doesn't work and they wonder why it doesn't work. And so we said, how can we treat this like an assembly line process? So we have what we call project managers that have tech backgrounds. They're highly sophisticated process driven people. And then what they do is they manage a pod. So the pod will have, say, eight to 10 virtual assistants. And each virtual assistant does one thing and does it really good. So if they're texting, they're texting. If they're KPI tracking, that's all they do all day. If they're list cleaning and building, that's that sole person's job. And so that project manager is responsible for managing that team that operates your entire company behind the scenes at a fraction of the cost of what somebody in the U.S. does. And the beauty is that they have a tech team on the same company in the physical uh, location. So they've got like 40 developers. So let's just say someone meets with their project manager and says, hey, I want Podio to do this, this, and this. And then I want it to track this on this report. Although those operational VAs will build the report, they have, they can pick up, they can stand up and walk physically to the 40 developers put a ticket in and they fix the podio issue or Salesforce, whatever it is within 24 hours. And so you get the best of both worlds between tech and ops in one building. Um, and I just love the fact that they're also physically all located in one building. So the speed of communication and how they operate in their culture that they're building is superior. That's amazing. I mean, you know, that kind of support that's already like built in versus a real estate investor starting from scratch and trying to find those people, trying to train those people. That's a phenomenal service that you have available for real estate investors. Tiffany, for the real estate investor that's looking for support, looking for uh, a team, uh, looking to grow their business, how would you describe your ideal client to work with you and your team on building their business? Um, so we always, we're big believers in starting in the foundation first. So for anyone doing deals out there, I don't care if you're doing one deal a month or 50 deals a month, we all have something to clean up on the front end of our company. So everything from systems, processes, SOPs, how we reverse engineer our marketing dollars before we go spend the money on marketing, all of our script processes, dispo processes. So we have a front end product that I don't care how big you are. You're going to watch that before attending anything of ours, because I believe you'll take something away that'll clean up something within your company that will make your people more productive before I just go say, Hey, let me teach you how to throw fuel on the fire and build your team bigger. So from there, we have a workshop where um, it's very intense over recruiting, onboarding, and training. And we do um, we actually onboard people as if you were starting at my company for half of one of the days so that they understand the level of detail we put into onboarding. Um, we go over our entire management framework, our marketing, and what we spend and why, um, all of our dispositions. And then from there, if someone wants us to also hold their hand, not only just them, but we also coach their staff for them. We take things off of their plate. 
Because a lot of times you enter these programs and what does it do? It gets you to go do more stuff, but then it increases the amount of hats that you wear. And ultimately my goal is that I release that from you. So while you go grow as a leader and we help groom that skill set, I now want to go help you keep your sales team consistent. So we perform call audits on their sales team for them. We train their sales team daily for them. We do basically a in-house fractional sales manager for their team as we continue to groom them as a leader behind the scenes. Um, so anyways, that's like our primary. And then we have another program that's for people doing three deals and under that's more foundational. So they have access to us every day and we're going over all of our marketing in detail, process flows, phone system setups, dialer setups, all that kind of stuff. Tiffany, what's the best way for someone to reach out to you and your team and learn more about how they can help or how about you can help them? Um, you can go to our website, which is tiffanyandjoshhigh.com. Remember, it's Tiffany and Josh High, not Josh and Tiffany. The women always comes first. Oh. Um, and then you go to work with us at the top and there'll be a page in which you can book a call with us and we can go from there and jump on a, on a call with them and we can do a business strategy bre breakdown and see where you're at with your company and if we can help move it forward. That's awesome. That website is www.tiffany, T-I-F-F-A-N-Y, Tiffany and, that's all spelled out, A-N-D, Tiffany and Josh, J-O-S-H, hi, H-I-G-H dot com. And of course, that website will be in the show notes uh, as well. Again, Tiffany and Josh com. Tiffany, thank you so much for joining me. And final word. No, I just appreciate you. And if there's any comments that get made on any videos from this that you guys like me to answer, I'm happy to do that. But I appreciate you bringing me on. Excellent, Tiffany. Thank you so much for joining me. There you have it, my friend. Another episode of Raising Private Money. I'm Jay Connor, the Private Money Authority. And if you found this episode valuable, which I know you did, my lands that we talk about private money on the onset or what, uh, be sure to like, subscribe. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure and ring that. If you're watching on uh, iTunes, be sure and click follow. I'm so excited to have you join me here on the uh, podcast. And I'm looking forward to seeing you right here on the next episode of Raising Private Money. Are you feeling inspired by the knowledge you gained in this episode? Then head over to jconner.com slash money guide. That's j-c-o-n-n-e-r.com slash money guide and download your free guide that shares seven reasons why private money will skyrocket your real estate investing business right now. Again, that's jconner.com slash money guide to get your free guide.